husband and I had retired and uh, we were looking for something to do. Uh, he suggested that perhaps if it didn't cost a lot of money would be helpful. And I um, said to him, well, what about starting to kite fly? We did as a child. The wind is free. You rather like that idea. So that's what we did. We bought a couple of American kites called Sky Nassers. And we used to go on to Portland behind the Portland Heights Hotel and spend a happy hour in the afternoon um, kite flying. And then we decided that perhaps we had, as we had two kites the same, we might try a little ballet together uh, where we'd watched it at other festivals where people stood together with the kites all on different lengths of line and made them dance in the sky beautifully. Well, I'm afraid our efforts were a bit crash-bang-wallop and they landed on the floor. Um, but anyway, it, it, that's how it started. And then we decided that perhaps we ought to look about insurance because if the kite comes down on a vehicle, it can cause a lot of damage. So I researched it and decided that probably Bristol was the nearest kite club that we could go to. And... Uh, that's what we did one September. We went up for their festival, first week in September, and uh, made ourselves known to the Bristol people, which they opened us with welcome. With uh, they welcomed us with open arms, and uh, we had a wonderful day up there. I remember in one instance, I sat on the grass in the warm sunshine, and watched an American group flying four kites in unison to the hymn of the Republic and I remember tears streaming down my face because it was just so, so beautiful. That developed into obviously buying more kites when you have the access to seeing kites and Gerald very kindly bought me a big uh, Japanese kite in, in the auction on the Saturday night when we'd had dinner with all the club. And um, the next day I decided that, well, I didn't know how to spar this kite and get it ready for flying so I walked around the arena looking for somebody who had a similar type kite and um, I found that the team from Holland had a very similar kite so I went up and said excuse me could you give me some help with this kite I want to get it flying today if possible so then we walked around to the various stalls that sell graphite spars and lengths of line and uh, handsets etc and after a couple of hours of struggling we actually managed to get this kite all ready to fly and then in the afternoon we managed to fly it it um, was a big oblong kite uh, with a plique uh, Japanese creature on it and it didn't fly terribly well because I didn't know anything about kite flying then. So obviously I was delighted that it actually got off the ground. And that sort of started the way that we um, had pleasure flying kites. On the seafront where we fly, you have the height of the hotels. If it's easterly wind, that's good because it's coming off the sea. So you can see it. And if it's coming from east southeast that's good because it comes from the pavilion end but if it's directly behind the houses you just don't get kites up on the beach but it's a good viewing area so that's why they do it I'll walk down a bit further and see if there's any down here after having met Yannicka at Bristol and she helped me so kindly with my kite uh, four years later, we kept contact all that time, but four years later, she rang me and said, Oh, I'm going to Weifong in China next April for the Weifong Kite Festival. And without hesitation, I said, Oh, I'll come. Um, let's go together and uh, we'll go for four weeks and we'll make a tour and we'll go to all the kite festivals that are there. And so that was decided very quickly. And that's exactly what I did in 1992. 
I flew from Heathrow to Amsterdam, picked up Yannicka, and then we flew to Beijing. And after that, we caught the train to Weifang. And this, this um, festival is held every year on April the 20th. I think we're at the 31st year at the moment, so it's been going for quite some time. And I went with the Dutch flying team as a member of their team, but very quickly in Weifong, they realized that I wasn't Dutch, um, and I was from England, and they actually had nobody in Weifong representing Great Britain that year. So I was quickly told that that was what I was going to be doing. I was going to represent Great Britain. And if you know, well, you all have seen the Olympics. Well, it's on a similar line. It is a huge festival. It starts off with an opening ceremony. And we're all lined up with um, our Chinese guide with our name on a board. And we march into the arena, which for me was such a humbling experience because there were just thousands of Chinese people sat in this huge stadium, um, very impassively, just sitting. They don't clap, they don't cheer. Uh, when we see our English team, we obviously give a big rousing cheer and clap them round, but nothing happened in Weifong. And I was a bit desperate. All I'd taken that year was a tiny little flag, and that would be made in China, the British flag. And obviously, it wasn't adequate for a stadium that size. But I think in circumstances like that, you probably get something given you to cope with that situation. And for some reason, I decided that I was going to blow kisses at them because I could reach the very floor of the stadium and I could reach the very high top of the stadium with a, a, a kiss. And it had such a reaction that every section as I went round, they all stood up and cheered and clapped. And uh, I was so thrilled to think that I'd actually managed to find some way of getting some response from them. But later I was told that, in actual fact, they call um, blowing kisses, flying kisses in China, and they are considered a little risque. So this was why I had this wonderful reaction. And of course it's had a knock-on experience because whenever I go in China now, everybody th throws me kisses, flying kisses I get.